the entrepreneurial journey podcast we're talking business and building a culture that's kick-ass where we make it happen grab your seat let's have a blast at the entrepreneurial journey podcast matembe with me she's the ceo and founder of money matics hi tina how are you doing i'm very good rebecca thank you for having me Absolute pleasure. Now, we were just chatting before we came on air. Um, I met you maybe two, three years ago at one of these networking dinners and Moneymatics was in its fairly early stages. So I'm just going to get right into it now and find out what you do and who you serve. So thank you. Thank you for asking. And that's such an interest. So interesting that, you know, it's been <laughs> A long time, feels like a long time ago right now. So I am the founder of Moneymatics and we are a financial inclusion company. We started out specifically to help people who are new to money and that can take many forms. It can change, uh, it, it can take a change in life moment. So change in circumstances, getting divorced, becoming an adult when you've been a young person, being new to country and helping to to map um, what financial well-being looks like for um, people in those circumstances but also and more importantly helping financial under uh, financial services understand what this looks like from a financial inclusion point of view because mm -hmm. you find that when you have a changing circumstance or an unusual or untold story as i like to call it you're not accounted for in the mainstream system so helping financial services think about those ways and uh, how they can be more inclusive when they're delivering financial services while helping communities to, to learn how to maximize their money in the UK. Right. Brilliant, incredibly useful and so important. And, and I was doing my research on you. You used to be a banker, did you not? Yes, I did. <laughs> I've actually been, been a banker in two, um, two different settings. So here and where I am from originally, uh, and that, that background in financial services and, and moving to the UK and becoming financially vulnerable suddenly, no matter that I had all the skills and all the seeming knowledge around it was, was what frightened me into thinking I needed to do something about this. Oh, tell me a little bit more about that, because I didn't know that part of your story. Um, yeah, so I moved to the UK uh, just over 15 years ago from Uganda, and um, I was a banker. My background is in, in law. I studied as a lawyer, and I was doing, I was in banking and legal services in Uganda. I moved here and uh, quickly became financially vulnerable because you're new to country, you don't have a credit file, you're being measured differently from, you know, what the reality is. And you cannot tell anyone <laughs> how good you are with money if it doesn't show on paper in the UK. Mm. Um, quickly combined with that, I had a child fairly, fairly soon. And uh, just going through that navigation of, of trying to leave, you know, trying to survive in the UK, she was now getting to an age where she was starting to find out about money and understand the uses of money. But I was like, wait, this is a whole different world, a different way of, of, of working. And I wanted her to get the best of both worlds, understanding money from a cash point of view, but also understanding uh, money in the UK. So what credit looked like. And I couldn't find a service that could help um, optimize this. So I went about creating resources to support her initially and later on communities of people who are like myself. Right. Okay. So f this is from real personal difficulties, wanting to have a better outcome for your daughter and then going, hang on a minute. It can't just be me and my daughter experiencing this, that it, there must be a wider issue. So there is the seed of a business. Now, had you ever thought you would run a business had you ever been entrepreneurial before or was it did that come as a shock to you well I I was born into an entrepreneurial family so uh, right. um the way I described it is I, I was sitting at board tables from when I was right. you know five years old because my parents run a business okay. typically uh breakfast was a board meeting you know so I had gone up around business it wasn't the path that I intended to, but I think when you're born and, and around that a lot, you're just used to problem solving. And if something doesn't have a solution, you're 
you're going to go and fix it. So that for sure, I had that background. But when I was going to study, for example, when I was going to school to do law, that was never my intention. I was like, I'm going to go and do law, become a barrister, you know, live the best life possible. <laughs> kind of I, yeah, I'm going to be super mainstream, super professional. I'm not going to do this self-employment lark. Yeah. But Absolutely. it's in your blood. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Very true. Yeah, no, so true. So, okay, I'm really genuinely curious to know the differences in attitude are between the UK and Uganda in terms of money, because us Brits tend to not like to talk about money at all. What culturally, what's it like in Uganda when you when it comes to money? Well, the first and most uh, important difference that, that caused the vulnerability in the first place is the whole credit rating system. Okay. That is very cash-based. You, you have money, you, you do stuff, you have physical cash, you plan for things. You, I mean, I, I use the example of building a house. When Whenever our parents were going to do a, like a building project, you go away, you save up money, you buy a plot of land and then you go away and save again and you build the foundation and, you know, things are incremental and you're seeing physical cash that's exchanging hands, that's being built up to, to create this. When I came here, this, this money just became airy-fairy. Mm. First of all, interestingly, and, and that's back to the point around um, being becoming vulnerable even when you, you're not supposed to be, we came with a lot of cash. Uh, okay. Because I mean, that's what we did. We we went to the bank. We we're moving to the UK. We withdrew cash. We declared it at the airport and and came in, and could not get a bank. Could not get banked because nobody wanted to take the cash. Everyone is asking uh -huh. for evidence of the cash, and it's this big thing. And we got the police pulled up on us in in a bank when we were really frustrated, and we we just threw the money on the table and and investigations of where the money was coming from. And this was all new to me. Um, so the, the biggest difference and that caused the vulnerability most was the whole use and an approach to money coming from cash to credit and needing to be tracked in some sort of system, whereas I was used to just having my cash on me. Yeah, it's something obviously growing up in the UK, I would never have considered at all. OK, good. Right. Crikey, that must have been awful to arrive here and suddenly be accused of being a criminal that that's not a nice feeling at all um so okay uh, let's roll forward how has the business evolved over the past i think it's been going since 2018 is that right that's yeah. right yes uh, where did it begin and where is it now oh rebecca that's we need we need two days for that right okay <laughs> So, um, as I mentioned, I, I thought, well, I've managed to come through this. We're now getting somewhere. We've we've um, started improving. We've we've got our feet on the ground. My daughter is now around eight years old, right. and um, she's becoming more and more detached from the realities of having to save or understanding what I felt were the basic principles of money. Um, so I'm like, gosh, I, I need I need something for this child. Um, I need a resource of some sort. I couldn't find any, there was a lot of financial education, but it was very theoretical, first of all. And secondly, it was not accounting for this circumstance where I was trying to teach the basic principles of cash and mm. the, the joys of credit, you know, that balance. So I thought I'm going to go away and create a piggy bank. And I want this piggy bank to have the different compartments of the lessons that I want to teach her. That was literally what I set out to do had a few okay. types drawn up and I'm like, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to create this piggy bank. It's going to be awesome. It was a caterpillar actually got some drawings done. And I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. And everything I'm going to teach is going to be based around these principles to, to bring cash and uh, virtuality to, to life. Um, got into the real world. And the first reality was, um, excuse me, nobody's using piggy banks anymore not the way you're trying to use them anyway. Um, so you might want to think about something digital. So okay. started having to change that thought. And indeed, all the research we did when we were doing the, you know, the, the user research was showing 
um, yep, this this needs to go digital. It needs to be something that's a, a digital resource. Um, so change the strategy and started teaching uh, physically, going to grassroots, going into schools and delivering. And then over lockdown, we found that, well, first of all, the business model crashed overnight when lockdown hit. Um, we were suddenly not able to go into schools. You know, that, that was just cut off immediately. But then a new situation arose where people who are underrepresented were very, very much more hit by COVID and the effects. Mm -hmm. So started getting called in to support around that, you know, financial well-being for um, underrepresented communities and, and how they manage money and why they don't have a buffer for money to, to, you know, deal with situations like when COVID happens. And so it's morphed into this a two-pronged approach to managing, helping people to manage money, but also helping services to understand how they can support customers, both young and old, to um, have better access to financial services and consumer duty, really. Hmm. So you, your um, influence has now spread into schools, into corporates, um, and uh, so that includes all kinds of uh, pockets of society, not just the underrepresented people. How are you spreading yourself so far and wide, Tina? What size of team do you have now? Yes, so oh, that's been another journey as well. But yeah. um, we have quite a we have a team of uh, delivery partners. So I have a, a bank okay. of staff that uh, come out to deliver when we're doing. Last week we were doing a, a Make Your Money Grow program, which is our youth program, and so we have a, a bank of staff that would come in and, and support us with that. And then we have a core team of five people who do the day to day, and we work on the corporate side. And then uh, we have a podcast that we've recently launched. So we have two other people working on that. So quite a diverse team. Uh, and we are, we, we're just learning how to, to morph the two, you know, having some offsite and some people that are on the ground. So it's, uh, it's getting there. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. Are you enjoying it? Yes, I love it. I, I, I love, love, love just, you know, seeing people seeing people growing and, and hearing someone coming back and saying, oh, yes, I did. I spoke to the bank and they said this or or a child uh, in one of our programs just going away and making a profit on a program we've been running. It's it's so fulfilling. It is. It's wonderful. I think um, learning, it's not even controlling money, isn't it? Is it? I mean, you're the expert. I'm trying to describe this, but it's understanding how to make money work for you rather than it controlling you does that make have I put that correctly a hundred percent it's right. um the first thing I always say to people is guess what we each have it in us to be able to manage money mm -hmm. because we need to define what m money looks like for us so everyone always thinks oh I'm not good at managing money no you you are because you get to decide how you want to approach it and once you settle that your mindset changes. Mm. Yeah, it, it really does. I can't remember when, I think I've always been quite good at saving a little bit every single month and watching it build up. Um, and as has been at the you know, times in your life when you've got kids and you're paying nursery fees and, and all kinds of things where that is not as much as you'd like it to be. But as I think it's getting into a habit, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And in this day and age, we can automate, you know, trying to automate as much as you can or getting an accountability partner, small changes or or um, for many of the communities we work with, joining our, a circle of friends who can, you know, save it together kind of thing. So just trying to find your flow and doing a little bit at a time that works for your schedule and your lifestyle. Yeah. Thanks for listening, everybody. Did you know at Tricress, we've built a kick-ass culture coach and consultant program. So if you're a business coach or consultant and you're looking for something new, add to your toolbox or even escape the nine to five, join us at our next event. Links in the information on the podcast. See you there. One of the wonderful Paula Wingate. I don't know whether you've met Paula Wingate, have you? She's 
one of those people that everybody knows. She sent me a book called um, The Compound Effect. And obviously, you being a financial person, you will fully comprehend the compound interest effect, magical yeah. impact. Um, but this book talks about that being across your life. And I think money is one of those things where you say the word and people kind of have this mental block, don't they? Absolutely. Uh, and they're kind of like, it's too big. I can't think about it. So they ignore it. Yeah. Um, how, how young are the young kids that you work with? When When is a good time to start teaching kids about money, do you think? Oh, it's uh, as soon as they can speak, they should be uh -huh. um, trying to understand because I, I look at money as a life skill. It is a life skill it, it, uh, because if you can manage money, well, it translates to other time. You'll be able to manage time better. There's many other things that you can teach. So as soon as you get the first opportunity, the moment they start asking questions, start having the conversations. Our mm -hmm. programs start from eight-year-old upward. So we have youth money camps that we, we run for eight-year-olds and up. And we have like a mid midlife uh, age group. So last week we were working with uh, children who are 14 to 20 thereabouts Brilliant. so Brilliant. and also it's, it's good to understand that there's different phases in life what you teach a two-year-old is different from what you teach someone going to start uni and it's yeah. also different from what you teach someone that's new to the country you know and it's trying to understand that flow of life moments and pegging education to that yeah I remember uh explaining to my kids about national insurance and paye <laughs> because they were so, so excited about getting i don't know their first proper full-time job and I went yes okay not all that money goes to you you have to yeah. give some of yeah. it to the government <laughs> oh mom where's that gone <laughs> absolutely absolutely we've had those lessons so many times as well yeah and the first first paycheck coming short of what you planned i'm thinking wait yeah. what <laughs> yeah yeah, absolutely. And then when they go out on their own, then there's council tax and this and utility bills. And, and then they go, I don't actually have as much as I thought I would. All right. Yes. Welcome to the real world. <laughs> absolutely. And to that point, actually, um, different taxes look different for different people. So when you are a student, you don't have to pay cancer tax. Or okay. if you're coming from another country, you may never have heard of cancer tax before. So... True. It may not sound appropriate, but sometimes even what sounds like the most basic thing you need to point out, because depending on someone's life moment, I may have spent the whole time at uni never having heard of cancer tax. And then it's suddenly, wait, what is that type yeah. thing? Yeah. yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So where are you taking these programs? How far and wide are you going? Um, at the moment, we are in the we are in Scotland and in England. We have a, a, a debt advice partner that's based okay. in England, and so we work across the you know Scotland and uh, England. We are hoping to get into Ireland, but we've not had a, an opportunity yet. We are in talks with a, a youth group there that we are hoping to go and deliver the youth program, okay. but. That's been on the cards for about six months now. Hopefully, I'll be able to say we're in Ireland soon too. Uh, but it's mostly the Scotland and England at the moment that we work. Cool. That's good. That's really good. Um, I'm interested to know how running a business has changed, if at all, or strengthened your own personal beliefs around money. What what difference has that made? Um. I think the biggest one is business is 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 like you can run your business as you do your family life depending on how on how far and how wide you want to do it. When you're a founder, unfortunately there it's 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 going to it's going to cross over because yeah. I mean I go to bed thinking about the business. I wake up it's another I tell my children because they're desperate for for a pet at the moment. And I'm like, guys, we have a pet, and that pet is called Moneymatics because it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's a fully fledged part of this household. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and totally. so I've, I've had to learn to, to bring them in as much as possible because you, you just have to be such a better custodian of your time. And managing money is just like that. It's being a custodian of your money. How, how are you going to look after it? And how are you going to, how, how are you going to interact with it? And that's what I've found that the crossover. So how how much do I want the children to get involved? How much 
Do I want my husband to get involved? I do a lot of traveling. How often do I involve them? Do I pick a few days on at the end of a trip so that they can, you know, not feel like mommy's not always around type thing? And it's the same with money. What what do I want the money to be saying about my lifestyle? What what areas of my life do I want to 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 you know applaud with with my money? Mm. And when you, I'm curious to know about this as well, because a lot of areas of society think it's a bad thing to want to make money. I've personally never thought that. I think, you know, it's a great thing to make money because you can do loads of good with it. Um, But do you come across those attitudes anywhere? Oh, no, you shouldn't want to make money. Every day, every day. Really? And and sadly, because of that, we, we think money is a taboo. We've, we've taught people yeah. that money is the root of all evil. We've taught mm-hmm. money people that money doesn't grow on trees. We, we have a psychological barrier that makes us ashamed. Uh, mm-hmm. And I was that person for a long time when I came to the UK because um, growing up, I had never had to think about money. Money was just a means to an end. I, I needed to go somewhere. Therefore, I needed to find money and the money was there. Mm -hmm. Um, but when I got to this place of of vulnerability, I suddenly had to think about money. And then you found that people would frown upon you for wanting the finer things in life. Mm -hmm. And we really need to change that attitude because, uh, a very good phrase I like to quote is there is no mission if you don't have a profit. So no matter Mm -hmm. how much good you want to do in the world, you need money to do that good. So if you have a mission or you want to achieve anything, you're going to need money. So you need to make money so that you can make a difference. And we need to get our heads around that. We also need to stop shaming um, quality of life or, you know, just because someone would like to go on holidays or that's what they choose to do. It's okay. And we need to start sending the right messages, especially to the younger people, because money is not the root of all evil. It is actually the, the root of all evil is not having money because that leads you to all sorts of unscrupulous activity. So in yeah. my experience, it's the lack of money that, that is the root of all evil. What totally. the issue is, is, is how you approach money and what you do with the money, but finding and having money in itself is, should not be, um, you know, made, a, made a, a big deal of or become villain. Yeah, I I agree. The Americans are better at this than us Brits, definitely. They they're good at celebrating wealth creators. Um and I know through the work I've done with American individuals and businesses, they're really good at putting back and putting a proportion of their income to philanthropic causes. Um and and so they directly link making more money to greater philanthropy which is brilliant and yeah they still have nice houses nice cars nice holidays and all the rest of it and they are they're not apologetic about it and I like that um we we definitely need more of that in the UK um not to lord it over people but to go do you know what it's okay to aspire to this um yeah, Absolutely. we need to celebrate. Um, we need to we need to celebrate it more when people are making money, and also we need to we need to not um, victimize people that have money, which is a, a big deal. You know, the the assumption which I find very interesting in the UK is that anyone that has money is evil or they're a bad yeah. person. It's like, wait, where is there anything in their reputation that says that? That's not the case at all. And we should, yeah. if anything, be looking up to them to learn from them because that means they're managing something right, you know? Yeah. So it's a mindset shift. Yeah. My mom thought that. My mom thought all rich people were evil. It's like, well, where, <laughs> what? Hang on a minute. Where, where on earth did you get that from? Because she thought to have money, you had to take it from somebody else. But that's a fundamental, I think, misunderstanding of money is that actually you create more. You don't take it off other people. You create more. It, it's not a finite resource. Yes. You've, you've touched on a great point, Rebecca, because even in business, you find that if you do not believe that you're helping someone, you are ashamed to charge a fee. You're mm-hmm. ashamed to ask for what your value is worth. You know, you, you don't account for your time well enough. And so you charge less or you're ashamed to market. 
actually another good example is we, we just don't like salespeople. We think salespeople and marketeers are the root of all evil. Again, they're just these pests, you know, whereas actually the fact that I'm, I'm bringing this to your attention means that I'm helping you with a service. If you're willing to part with your money for something, it means I'm adding value or it should mean that I'm adding value. So the key should be on, on, on measuring quality of delivery than yeah. actually asking what you're charging for something. Yeah, totally agree. So where are you taking the business? What's the big plan, Tina? Well, financial inclusion for everyone in the UK. <laughs> Love That's it. A very big deal. Uh, I would like to to engage with the uh, most mainstream financial services and policymakers um, from the point of view of, I feel that a lot of the, the poverty we see and the, and the financial issues in society are unnecessary. We, mm. we just are not, people know how to manage money if we give them the right resources. Yeah. But we're not good at communicating what resources are available. As I've just given some examples, we, we vilify having money and that sort of thing. Financial services have a responsibility um, and everyone, I mean, insurance services providers have a responsibility to be more visible and to be more inclusive to everybody. And um, if, if, if all of us are able to do better with money, the economy thrives. So yeah. my, my, my goal, my goal is to, to look to engage with as many uh, financial services and providers and show them how they can make their resources more inclusive and help yeah. people get better. Yeah. And actually go into the communities, Tina, because, you know, in, in poorer communities, they don't come into the city centres, which is where the banks are these days. Um and and all, obviously all the local branches have now closed. So they need to go out into the communities uh, where the people are at who need the most support. And I guess that's what you're doing. And you just need a big machine to help you get into those areas, don't you? Absolutely. Yeah, it's um, reaching people at their point of and their place of, of need or wherever they yeah. are. And also not bombarding them. So if if my issue right now is getting on the property ladder, let's deal with that. If my issue right now is putting food on the table, let's deal with that. So not bombarding and, and giving the right information at the right time on the user's terms, not on, on your term because you're a bank. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. So I have a great savings habit. I save at least 10% of my income every month. Um, and I learned this a few years ago. I paid off 20% of my income, paid off some residual debt I had. I then started saving 10%. In fact, I saved more than 10% now. And what a difference it makes in a really short space of time. And it's so easy to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's um, I always tell people, think about what every pound that's coming into your life is doing. Is it saving some? Is it giving some, you know, being a bit philanthropic? Is it investing some for tomorrow? And is it leaving some today, right? So what is every pound you're doing? Yeah. What Every pound that comes into your life, what's it? What's What story is it painting? I like that. I like that analogy. Right. Tina, if your business had a personality or a character, how would you describe it? Ooh, a personality as in... Let me go for a superhero. Cool. <laughs> Let's see. A cross between. I love Thor. <laughs> oh, yes. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think he's a dreamer and he's able to, he's just has this massive strength and a bit of Wonder Woman, a bit of sparkle oh. and Wonder Woman. <laughs> I love Wonder Woman. I love yeah. I grew up in the 70s. So I grew up with the original. It's take me ages to track you down to get onto the podcast so I know you're phenomenally busy so thank you so much and I wish you the best of luck and yeah I'd love to see everybody in the UK uh, with a decent financial education thank you it's been lovely speaking with you Rebecca look out and listen out for our next entrepreneurial journey podcast with Colin Stevens, an MBA skills coach. He's built a fantastic coaching academy for basketball and he's now using
coaching skills to support men in their emotional development, in their business development, in their relationship development and running retreats for men. He's a fantastic guy and you really ought to listen to him. Thanks for listening, everybody. Did you know at TriCress, we've built a kick-ass culture coach and consultant program. So if you're a business coach or consultant and you're looking for something new, add to your toolbox or even escape the nine to five, join us at our next event. Links in the information on the podcast. See you there. The Entrepreneurial Journey Podcast. We're talking business and building a culture that's kick-ass where we make